Um, how we go to dinner, we eat meals differently in different situations. Imagine the situation. I am with my wife. We are celebrating our 15th wedding anniversary, which is this year. Uh, we are at the Key Restaurant in Circular Key, a six-course degustation menu uh, paired with wine. Uh, we are sitting there, and, and we are prim and proper. Uh, I, I've shaved freshly this, not this. Uh, but the, I've, I've put on beard balm. I've got my best tie and uh, suit jacket on, uh, and we're ready to have... I've got my shiny, squeaky shoes on, and we're ready to, uh, to, hear for, uh, to have a lovely meal together. And then when the course has come out, uh, we take photos of it, uh, we, we discuss about what bone marrow noodles actually are, and, and, and then we post it on Instagram. Um, during our conversation, during that time, we, we reminisce about the ways that God has blessed us uh, in our marriage and how his blessings have come through it. Uh, and we take our time. We are not rushed. We enjoy the scenic view. We see the sun set and the night lights of Sydney sparkle in the darkness. And we have a night of it. Uh, imagine that scenario. Now compare that with we're in, on a long road trip. <laughs> We're from the Gold Coast, come down to Sydney. We packed the carnival. It's filled to the brim of things that we use in the Gold Coast. Uh, the dog is in the car as well. Um, everyone's tired. We've been on long on the road. We're stopping at Port Macquarie. Uh, we've got another six hours on the car trip to go, but we need to eat, and we need to eat fast. We're, we get Maccas. We get the family value meal box. And, and we, there's this big discussion over who gets the good burgers and who gets the cheeseburger. Um, and then when we eat, we have to place ourselves away from other people because we're really worried about COVID. Uh, then we have to eat fast because we want to get back on the road. And then after the meal, we have to actually let our kids run like crazy around the park to get rid of the energy that they have so they can sit in the car for another four to six hours. Completely different scenarios, aren't they? Because the way that you eat is different depending on the situation that you're in. If we can go to the next couple of slides, uh, Elijah, that'd be great. Um, they're very different. And so and this is the situation that the Corinthians were facing as well. Uh, and it looks, sorry, back one, Elijah. And it looks very different. Uh, see, some people in the church were having raucous parties with fine food and, and booze flowing. And only some were invited to that. And they were linking that party to the Lord's Supper. They were linking that party to church and painting Christ's name on it. And Paul is like in this passage, no. That is not appropriate for what the Lord's Supper is, for what we are to be doing in the church, for there is to be no division. All right, so that's what we're looking at today, a situation where in the Corinthian church, um, communion had gone wrong. And so what we don't need to do is look at it, of course, in the context. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, we looked at how there were head coverings was an issue in worship. Uh, then today we're looking at how there is issues of communion and the way that the Lord's Supper was taken. And then next time that we continue in this series, not next week but the week after, we will be looking at uh, the, the speaking in tongues and spiritual gifts. And in each of these three issues, the core problem is disorder and chaos in the way that the church service was run. Okay, so that's what Paul is talking about. Each of these three things, disorder and chaos, for they are dishonoring uh, God uh, and they are deglorifying God and bring disorder into the church. And so we need to look at this in terms of that context. The other thing that I will need to note is that we're, we won't actually be doing 1 Corinthians 12 in this series, okay? Uh, one body, many parts. The reason for that is we covered it just recently in our spiritual gift series. And I'd be using very similar ideas. And I, I personally, I like the idea that I get to mention Voltron, you know, the robots, one body, one part, many by, parts, one body. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, I would basically do a very similar sermon. If you can't remember what that sermon was about, though, it is on YouTube and you can watch it there to continue the flow of 1 Corinthians. When we come back to the series, we'll be jumping to 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, so we come to our passage then. Verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Now, this is a really harsh statement. And what is, and that this is what the, all the three issues are kind of tied into. Um, it would be better if people didn't go to church than to come to the, what is happening now in the church uh, because it is creating so much damage. And this is harsh, right? Like if someone said this 
about our church, it's better that people don't attend your church service than maybe I need to rethink what I'm doing as a pastor. Yeah? So this is a big statement that he is saying, putting on the Corinthian church. And then in verse 18, he says, uh, in the first place, where it kind of implies there's heaps of issues in the Corinthian church service. Uh, this is just one that he's going to focus on. And then we look at the issue of what was going on. And we can find that best in verse 20 to 22. When you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Now, we need to remember the context of Corinth. Uh, Corinth was a uh, cosmopolitan metropolis. It was culturally diverse. Everybody from different backgrounds and different places uh, in the same city. And there was a huge diversity in the economy as well. There were extremely rich, wealthy individuals, but also very poor individuals and everyone in between. And the next thing is that uh, often when people were worshipping idols, there was a banquet involved. Uh, so uh, there were banquet rooms uh, attached uh, to temples of worship. And so what people would do is sacrifice the animals to their idols, and then they would have a massive party where booze and food would flow. And so that was the culture of religion in that area. And then what they, this certain group of wealthy people have done is taken that idea and then attached it to the Lord's Supper. Now, we do acknowledge that there were t instances in the Bible where people ate a common meal together. Uh, this happened in Acts 2, 42. You can see that they sometimes did it daily. Uh, and again, in Jude 12, uh, Jude refers to a love feast uh, that was happening. Uh, and that is a meal uh, of believers attached to communion. But for the most part, um, the Lord's Supper was separate to that. So it's, I, you can have a meal while separating Lord's Supper, but not like what they were doing. Not with the division that the Corinthian church were putting in. Um, in the relation to the specific issue, um, the idea, there's a little bit of debate about this, uh, but the idea is that it's most likely that rich people came with quality food early, then they ate it and they drank uh, wine to the point of getting drunk, and then the poorer people and the Christian slaves came in after that. And by the time they got there, there was nothing left on the plates. Um, the idea is that there was a, a minority of affluent believers and they kind of were doing the heavy lifting of financially supporting the church, okay? And so the church met in homes. Well, it was the rich people's homes that they met in. And these guys were having a party without the have-nots uh, before um, as part of their church service. Uh, rich people were people of leisure. They were noble men and women. They didn't have a nine-to-five job. Uh, but the poorer Christians, uh, the Christian slaves, did. And there was no, at this time, no legalized day off in the Roman Empire. There was no weekends. And so people had to work every day. And so that's why the, some of the poorer Christians were getting there later than the rich Christians. And so when the rich Christians came, uh, they would bring their quality fine foods of grey poupon, caviar, macarons, and sashimi. Uh, not war arrowroot biscuits, a watered down cordial, and fairy bread. Uh, but don't get me wrong. Fairy bread is dope. So uh, the reason the, uh, they were working and so they didn't have the money or the ability to bring the truff white truffles and escargot that the others were bringing, they were lucky to get hot dogs together. And this created a division between the have and have nots in the church. And contextually, culturally, there was already a gap. Um, there was, of course, rich people of Corinth would not eat with poor people in Corinth. Uh, they would, rich people wouldn't share their lobster with the uh, poor people. I mean, the poor people probably didn't even know what to do with that little fork that you've got to stick in to get the good bits out of the arm. They wouldn't know what to do with that. And so this idea for rich people to eat with poor people was a cultural anathema. It was not something that would happen uh, normally in community. Why would the wealthy share their slow-smoked pork jowl with fermented shiitake custard? Why would they ha share such a food with these commoners? Oh no, they're not bathed in the finest lavender. It's hard enough that I must worship with them. Surely I don't need to eat with them as well. Oh, oh, oh. That is the idea. 
There is a separation between the rich and the poor. And this was a culturally acceptable division. But it was not a spiritually accepted division. It is not a Christ-like acceptable division. For in the church there is to be equality, regardless of social and economic status. Equality, regardless of cultural power that is attained outside the church. Equality, regardless of health, wealth, or other. The way these rich Christians were parading their wealth, flaunting it in front of those who did not have anything, was an abhorrent to Paul and should not happen in the church of Christ. It's not okay. There is to be unity in the church and equality amongst our members. I was at uh, Gordon Baptist, um, a previous church of mine, and, and one of the members who goes to that church was a big wig in the Baptist Association, uh, really high up there, right? And his son was in my youth ministry, and I had to make sure that I didn't give him special attention because of who his dad was, in comparison with Dave, whose dad was a kitchen hand. Because the tendency is, well, I want to get in the good books with the big wig because maybe that will help my career. But that is not how we should operate in the church. There is to be equality. We treat everyone the same, regardless of who they are outside of these walls. There is a culturally acceptable division, but it should not leach into the church. It should not leach into the way that we treat each other. For especially when we're talking about the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper is about sharing the body of Christ, sharing together, equal. And Paul kind of wraps this up in verse 22. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? If you want to eat your slow-braised quail with a cured egg yolk in unami broth, do so at home. Invite your hoity-toity friends, have a party, but don't bring that into the church and don't paint Christ's name on this division that was occurring. Okay, so that's the first point. But before we move on, I want to kind of drill a little bit into this application of unity and what it can mean for us. Uh, because this socially acceptable uh, division is part of Australian culture too. We can see that about where people live. Um, Elwood, great community. Uh, uh, Campsy, Asian. Uh, Cabramatta, Vietnamese. Um, Arncliffe, Lebanese. Um, uh, the white people live in the Shire or the Eastern Beaches or the Northern Beaches. Like, that's kind of where we live, right? And yet, when we bring that uh, into the church, we are dishonouring Christ. We are not being the church that God created us to be. For we must be unified. Unity um, in diversity. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, Elijah. When you have a bowl full of M&Ms, it's very easy just to be a part of that, right? Because uh, when there is unity in unity, that's easy. It's easy for me to love people who love me. It's easy for me to love people who look like me, who think like me, who talk like me, who are interested in the things like me uh, and subscribe to the Disney Channel like me. It's easy for me to be unified with people who are very much like me. But you compare that to the next slide, it's, very, it's a lot harder to be unified when you are different, when there is diversity. See, the ideal church is diverse. We should have a range of ethnicities, a range of socioeconomic backgrounds, a range of ages. Unity amongst diversity is much harder than unity amongst unity. Unity amongst diversity is Christ-like unity. Unity amongst diversity is where the world sits up and takes notice. Oh, you go to a church with a whole heap of people who are just like you. Big whoop. <laughs> so do I when I go to the pub. So do I when I hang out with my friends. But for us to be different, for us to proclaim the gospel with who we are, we are to have unity in diversity. And there is a tendency for us as a church not to do that. Um, ethnic churches do this. They, they separate based on ethnic lines. So you can go to church and just be around the people who are the same cultural background as you. Uh, but then in... Other churches, particular big ones, you have a uh, traditional service of hymns for the old people, uh, then you have the family service for the families, and then you have the, the evening service for youth and young adults. And what you've done there is you've segregated along age lines. So the youth of the church never gets to be uh, take in the wisdom and maturity of the older people of the church. The highlight, the goal, the, what we need to be striving for as a church is not unity amongst unity, but unity amongst diversity. 
That is where the church is being what Christ wants us to be. That is when the world will sit up and take notice. Um, I, I love that we as a congregation are a very diverse congregation. We have many different socioeconomic backgrounds. We have many different ethnic backgrounds. We have uh, a 90-year-old and a uh, two-year-old, uh, a one-year-old. Uh, yeah, so Elijah's in the back. So yes, yeah, one-year-old. And so that's awesome. But then, even in that situation, we need to be careful that we're not just, oh, well, one group goes over, the old people sit at the table, and the young people stand up, and, and I will only hang out with those because they're like me. As a church, we still need to make sure that we have unity amongst our diversity, um, equality, uh, treating everybody the same, having a conversation not just with the people like me. So if I just came into after coffee and had a conversation with Sam, we talked about who should be the next James Bond uh, for the next 20 minutes, that's not the goal. The goal is that I talk to other people who are not like me and that I'm able to fellowship in the way that Christ wants us to. In the Corinthian church, there was, uh, there was disunity and division uh, based on what they did or did not have. In our church, there is to be unity. I've been thinking a lot about politics recently, uh, specifically in relation to the factions in politics. And they're always divisive. These factions go against each other and it hurts the party as a whole. Now, you can see that this on both wings of politics. In Liberal, you've had three prime ministers uh, in Abbott and then Turnbull and then Morrison. Um, and before that, in Labour, you had Rudd, Gillard, Rudd. And a lot of this is because of factional bite backbiting. What would our political parties look like if they were unified? If there was no backbiting? If, if there was no text messages about the IQ or integrity of the leader, if there was no mean girls labels being thrown around, what if there was actual unity in our political system? How much awesome would it be for us as a country if that was the case? Well, how much awesome would it be if we have no factions, no cliques, no division in the church? How much more could we achieve for Christ? Okay. So that's the issue, and then unity. Uh, then Paul, in verse 23 to 26, looks at a doctrine or a theology of communion and how it should be taken. Verse 23 to 26, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, this passage is very similar to the passages found in the Synoptic Gospels, and that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's very close to Luke's version of the Last Supper, and that's because Paul and Luke were travel companions. But then to understand communion, you kind of need to understand where it came from. Uh, that is the Last Supper, where it was created by Christ. But then to understand the Last Supper, you need to understand what he was doing because he was actually having the Passover feast. And so you need to understand a little bit about that. Uh, the Passover festival was where Jews ate unleavened bread um, as a reminder of what they needed to do when they left Egypt, when God saved them from Egypt. And if you look at the Passover meal, it's a very structured meal where there are, every element refers to something, a part of the story of the Exodus of God's nation, God's people being drawn out of Egypt and into the promised land. Um, so what would happen at the beginning of the Passover feast is the head of the household would take a common loaf, break it into pieces and give it to um, the people of, of the meal. And that's what Jesus did when he breaks the bread and says, this is my body given to you. And then the cup is most likely to be the, three, the third of four cups of wine uh, consumed during the Passover meal. And again, it has echoes of redemption. Uh, this third cup is where Exodus 6.6 6 is read out, which says, I redeem you. And in that way, Christ is taking that specific cup and using that as a pointer to the fact that he redeems us. He, through his death, through his sacrifice, through his broken body and poured out blood, redeems us, forgives us. Jesus takes on the wrath that we deserved so that we could have peace with God. And it's from this setting that he says, this is my body. Uh, through the idea here, Paul is saying, is that through continual celebration of the Lord's Supper, believers proclaim the Lord's death. Now this verb only occurs in Acts and Paul. What it means is to proclaim Christ, to proclaim the gospel, to preach Jesus. Jesus. 
We are to celebrate the Lord's Supper regularly, and when we do, we remember Jesus. We remember what he did. We remember his sacrifice. We remember what it achieved. Just as the Jewish people took Passover and remembered God saving them from from Egypt, we take communion and we remember Christ saving us from our sins. Do this in remembrance of me. So the first point was the issue of the Corinthian church and the application of that was unity. The second point is a theology or doctrine of how to take communion well. And then I kind of want to drill down on that because communion has been taken and misunderstood and uh, we have so many different ways of doing communion as a whole, we kind of need to unpack that a little. First, there is a lot of false teaching revolved around communion. Um, This comes particularly from the Catholic uh, teaching. Uh, The first one is this idea of transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is the doctrinal belief where uh, when when we take the bread and drink the cup, that it turns into, in some way, the actual blood and body of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't think that's what Jesus meant. Uh, It's definitely not what the disciples thought he meant as they were taking it, um, that, that his body got transform just from there to over here. That's not what they would have believed either. And I don't think that's what Paul is saying. So that's one idea of communion that is not from the Bible, that it's not true. The next idea is called ineffective, uh, incomplete sacrifice. Now, this idea is that the sacrifice of Jesus for your sins is not enough. That's not enough. You must do Christ plus. And one of the pluses is communion. That communion, by taking the bread and the, wine, and the grape juice, and that, you are, that there is some salvific effect, some salvation purpose are happening as you do that. That you are somehow saved a little bit more because you had communion. And yet, as the Reformation show proved true, it is through Christ alone that we are saved. Not Christ plus, just Christ. So not Christ plus mass, Christ plus church service, Christ plus offering, Christ plus communion. It's just Christ. Another question then that we need to uh, look at is how do we take communion? Because churches of different traditions and backgrounds do it very differently. Um, Do we do it every week? Do we do it once a month? Do we do it once or twice a year? Or do we only do it at Easter? How do we take it? Do we get in a line and and take a common piece of bread and a common cup? Um, Do we have stewards go out like we do? Uh, Once at a church I was in, we got everyone uh, to get their cup and their bread and then to stand around in a circle of the church. And the idea was that we would be unified in one church. The problem is, a whole heap of people who were not Christian didn't take communion and sat in the middle and we're all looking at them. That was awkward. We never did that again. Um, there, are, there is this diversity of how we take it. Um, I mean, do you have wine or do you have grape juice? Uh, do you have unleavened bread or do you have like a bread roll? Um, once at a youth group uh, camp, we had communion through pizza and Coke. Um, and it is pushing it a lot. But the idea, the idea here is that the further away you get from the bread and the wine, uh, the less powerful the symbol is. Because the symbol is what points to Jesus. Um, and, and while we can do communion in different ways, what is most important is what it's there for, not how we take it. Uh, that it points us to Jesus, that we remember him, uh, that we remember Christ. Okay, so that's how to take communion. But then Paul, in verse 27 to 34, looks at the Corinthian example and goes, this is how not to take communion. Uh, we see that in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Uh, The church in Corinth, through their division, were taking it in an unworthy manner. Uh, Now this, the Greek term of unworthy is anaaxios, which kind of means bad action, like it's unworthy action. So you know how someone will say, uh, you're silly, and say, well, I'm not saying you're silly, I'm saying your actions are silly. Um, And that's what Paul is saying here. Um, He's not saying that they're unworthy, sinful life, though that is coming out, but rather he's saying the actions of what they were doing and linking to communion was unworthy, unworthy of the way it was being done. Uh, Then, verse 28, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Instead of eating communion with division, 
we need to examine ourselves. Uh, proper self-examination so we don't even drink judgment on ourselves. Because to take communion means that we self-assess. We look at who we are and who Christ is to us. Uh, we are led into a time of repentance where we take our sin that we have been committing on a far too regular occasion and we leave that on the cross. And we say, Lord, I am sorry for what I have done. I am sorry for what I am doing. Please, will you forgive me? Please, through your Holy Spirit, give me the strength that I am not saying this to you again next time. Please give me the ability to get distance from my sin, to work against the sin in my life, to break those chains that have tied me for so long. Communion is to be taken with a, um, a, a temperament of self-examination, of understanding who we are as we come to the communion table, what we have done, and an intentional striving to do different. Then in verse 29, we need to note that it supports the idea that communion is only to be taken by those who believe. Um, because if you don't recognize Jesus and you take communion, then you're drinking judgment on yourself. Um, so communion is for those who have a real relationship with him. Then we see verse 30, and verse 30 is really tricky here. Uh, that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep or died. Um, this is tricky because Paul is saying that some in the Corinthian church have been, because of their actions, have been judged by God in a physical way. They have gotten sick and some have even died as a punishment from God for their sins. And we don't often make this link. We don't often think about this. But it happens a number of times in the New Testament that Paul is saying that this can occur. We must remember at this time Ananias and Sapphira in uh, Acts 5. Uh, these two people, they sold a piece of property. Um, they, the husband came to Peter and said, this is all the money that, of my property that I'm giving to the church, when in actual fact he had saved some for himself. Peter goes, are you sure? And the guy goes, yeah. And then the guy drops dead. Um, his wife comes in and Peter asks, hey, is, was that all the money? And the wife goes, yeah. And Peter goes, liar. And Sapphira dropped dead as well. There is this uh, biblical precedence of people being judged for their sin. Uh, Paul will go on to argue later on um, that in 2 Corinthians, suggesting that physical judgment in this way most often occurs due to a group, collective or community sin rather than a personal sin of one. But it does raise the option that this could happen. And it means that we must take our sin more seriously. Um, and when Jesus does that, he doesn't do it as an authoritarian judge just to make us hurt. He does it as a loving father disciplining his children, hoping that they would come back to a right relationship with him. And Paul then wraps this all up in verse uh, 33 to 34. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. Corinthians when they gathered together and had their common meal, they would wait till everyone was there. They should share their caviar or macarons with everyone and therefore not have division, therefore not have eating and drinking communion in an unworthy manner, therefore not doing so without self-examination. And when they do so, to remember and proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we take communion, we must do it properly. Pointing to Christ self-examining ourselves as we do so. Let me pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this message. We pray, Lord, that you will apply it now as we uh, take communion. I pray, Lord, that you are still us, that you enable us, lead us into a time of self-examination and repentance. Lead us into a time where we become painfully aware of our sin and enable us to bring it to your cross. Enable us to leave it there. Enable, Lord, we can't do this alone. We need your strength to break the sins, break the chains of sin that have entwined us so in our history, in our life, in our past, in our yesterday. Help us to be different through the power of your spirit. Enable us, Lord, to take communion well, in a worthy manner, proclaiming Christ, remembering him, and doing so in self-examination. In your name, amen. So we're actually going to do this now. We're going, I'm going to lead you into a time of our communion. And we're going to have a, a period of quiet time.
now, where I want you to reflect, where I want you to have that self-examination that Paul is encouraging his church to have, uh, to think of yourself, to think of who you are and what you've done, to think of Christ, to think of who he is and what he has done. Let's spend a time in silence and then I'll ask the stewards to come and deliver the others. Please take the bread. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink in it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes may we take the cup Dear Lord, break our heart for what breaks yours. Enable us to see our sin with new lies. Enable us to come to the cross with humble, humble and repentant hearts. For Lord, your sacrifice on the cross 
was unimaginable and unexplainable. That you would do this for us, that you would give away so much so that we might have so much. Lord, we are not worthy. Nothing we can do can ever make us worthy. But you do. You make us worthy through your death and resurrection. We praise you, Lord, for that. May our lives be lived in the shadow of the cross. May our lives echo the glory of Christ because of the great things that he has done for us. May we love because you first loved us. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross. Thank you for everything that that gives us. In your name, amen. If I can ask